So make sure they're well-rounded. Yes. Make and sure, make sure, sure they can climb a rope. Those are the two things. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, so pretty much. Solid. Don't just well, throw spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. All right? Like, take your time. Pick your people. Welcome back to Leaders Recon. Today, we're at the top of the Rappel Tower with uh, Sergeant First Class Hauler and Staff Sergeant Pounding talking about Air Assault School. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Thank, Thank you for you. having us. So, I guess, you know, you always hear Air Assault School, your tin hardest stays in the Army. Can you give us a little bit of an example, like what is Air Assault School in a nutshell? Uh, yes, so Air Assault School, essentially you got three phases. Um, you start off on zero day before you actually fully in process, running uh, two miles uh, within 18 minute standard. Okay. Uh, our course here at Fort Benning is the hardest one, obviously, uh, the hilliest. And then right after the two mile run, you go into the obstacle course uh, where you have two mandatory obstacles and seven additional obstacles where you can only fail one of the seven. Okay. And then after that, you get into the phase. Once you pass that, you get into the phases. Uh, phase one is mostly all classroom, uh, where you're getting aircraft orientation, aircraft safety, all, all the classroom stuff. Um, and you have tests on that, which gets some people that's not academically standard. And then move into phase two, which is sling loads. Okay. Uh, where that's mostly all outside on the loads, getting classes, learning how to inspect them and learning deficiencies. And then you do a written test and a hands-on test for that, uh, which is where we lose most of our people. Mm -hmm. uh, Roughly about 25% of our class every course is on the sling load hands on portion. And those lucky enough to make it to phase three is the fun stuff repelling, where you repel we off right the tower here. and out of aircraft, uh, usually a UH 60 from 90 feet up. Sweet. So, you know, breaking that down, you mentioned you lost some of the course, or, you know, what, or I guess before we get into that, actually, is there any minimum requirements for? Uh, students when they are soldiers before they become students here to get into the course so for to actually enter into air assault school uh, you just have to do their prereqs which is basic does he have a passing PT score um, okay. army standard uh, we generally look for something that's higher than 240 but it's just army standard so 180 on the AC the ACT and then the ACFT uh, they just have to meet their required mints based off of yeah. their unit standard. Um, and then also medical portion, uh, which gets a lot of people is just if their IMR is up to date, if they have a physical within the last year, uh, and that all their pulleys on their IMR read within good parameters for our medical personnel too. So on that note with uh, the, the physical requirement, is that that's not an airborne physical or anything, it's just a regular? It, it's just a basic, normal pha okay okay basic physical uh the only requirements to that is you can't be on permanent profile to come to this course so if you have a walking profile you're not going to be allowed to enter into air assault school um, or any other physical profile that hinders you from doing a ruck march an obstacle course climbing a rope anything of the such so. so then speaking of like what comes out of air assault school you know what is the you know, what are the skill sets that you're getting as aerosol graduates or like, you know, what's that purpose and background for the course? Uh, so essentially it's the introduction to sling loads is okay. the biggest thing that people use. Um, just because as normal soldiers in army units, you don't do sling loads. You don't have any uh, reason to learn yeah. that. Uh, so I think that's what most people get the most out of. So sling loads and then the repelling. Um, I believe they still do repelling at basic training. I know they stopped it for a little bit, but I think they're back doing it. Uh, but after basic training, most people don't do repelling, okay. uh, especially out of aircraft. And so that's what most people look forward to is being able to repel out of an aircraft, in my opinion. So, mm -hmm. so you mentioned, or one of you mentioned that the, like you, know, you lose 25% of the students, you know, during that sling loads phase of the course, you know, what are, you know, what makes the course challenging, I guess, or what do you find makes the course most challenging? So a good majority, so phase one is the combat assault phase. So it's 
generally just realizing, eh, not realizing, but um, understanding the capabilities of different aircraft. Okay. So most people aren't in an aviation unit or haven't worked with aviation assets overseas. This is their first experience to it. So for some, it is very challenging just to take the phase one exam, the combat assault portion, um, learning all different aircrafts and their capabilities. For phase two, it, go, it dives into attention to detail. Um, where with a sling load, the littlest thing that you miss and you sign off on could crush a house if it's released from the aircraft or it could destroy a $5 million aircraft if it malfunctions in the air, you know? So phase two, they're met with a lot of different types of loads and tiny little things that can make or break that load. Um, and it's their responsibility as an aerosol qualified individual to inspect it and sign off saying that, yes, this load is good to fly. Um, so. When did you lose very many students in the last phase or? Uh, in repelling? No. Uh, we might maybe lose like five. <laughs> yeah, the only reason we lose people in phase three is if after they get tested on how to tie the hip propel seat or hook up, they tie it wrong or they do a fatal hookup. Oh, okay. Um, so, which is where they have an inverted carabiner and if they went off the tower of their craft, they wouldn't catch. They could possibly just fall. Um, but we catch that before that happens. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so. so then you know, looking at it, you know, obviously you mentioned a lot of attention to detail and you, oh, and the O course, I can't, I can't forget the O course. I feel like, you know, so we were actually just, uh, just filming a lot of the students the other day when they went through the O course. Um, you mentioned the tough one being one of the required obstacles at the beginning. You know, what's, you know, what are some of those key skills that they need to be able to do physically coming here to get through a couple of those requirements, like the O course, like the ruck marches? So, of course, I think the biggest thing that gets people is not being able to climb a rope. Okay. Uh, for the tough one, uh, that is about 80% of our failures on the O course is people just not being able to climb a rope. Uh, so, after that, it's the weaver is gets a few people just because you're weaving your body around stuff and people can't move like that. And then the confidence climb is the third highest failure uh that is just displaying confidence as you climb up a ladder and where when you get to the top of it you're literally not touching the ladder at all to grab to the next rung mm -hmm. and the people that are too scared or scared of heights have an issue with not touching something while they're 30 feet in the air so makes sense as a mandatory obstacle uh, that gets to some people but and you and, and i think i couldn't remember you mentioned what were the three mandatory obstacles or there two there are two mandatory obstacles. The first obstacle is the tough one, and the and second one, one is the one that starts with the rope climb, right? Right. Okay. So um, I think the biggest thing for students that come to aerosol school is to be a real well-rounded individual physically, um, have stamina, have strength, but uh, similar to the new Army ACFT, can you do multiple different types of exercises that target lower body, upper body? Uh, to be successful in this course, you need both. Uh, you can't just be, I'm super strong in the arms. You got to be also lower body strong for ruck marches, climbing a rope. To... So how, how, how is that? You, you mentioned attention to detail earlier. When it comes to getting through aerosol school and all things, like obviously there's physical aspect, you got attention to detail, there's some writ written tests and stuff. You know, what are some of those key things that you recommend that students should prepare for um, before they get to the course, you know, as an instructor? So a big thing, um, one, know how to climb a rope. Uh, just saying you know how to climb a rope, gym style from like elementary school isn't gonna cut it here because you're gonna do physical events that are gonna tire portions of your body that would typically aid you in climbing a rope one time. Okay. Um, have a good technique. Um, there's multiple different techniques to climbing a rope. Here in aerosol school, we generally teach individuals or we show them, we don't necessarily teach them it. Um, you should know how to climb a rope com before coming. But uh, the S wrap, which is one way to lock in on the rope to kind of give your arms a little bit of a, uh, a break. And then the J hook, which also to give your arms a little bit of a break. So 
not a climber row before you come here. Uh, there's YouTube tutorials that you can Google to uh, figure out how to do it. Yeah, but... I think we're gonna try to do some sort of little, our own little tutorial after this maybe, <laughs> <Yeah>. so. <laughs> Hopefully we can help with that, so. So, know how to climb a rope, and then you mentioned attention to detail. How does that? Study habit. Yeah. Can you retain information quickly? Because at least in combat assault, a majority of all your classes are all death by PowerPoint. So can you retain what you just learned and two days later spit it out for a 50 question multiple choice written exam? And, and on that, you know, on that note, right, you mentioned like the three phases of the course, I guess, earlier, right? Yeah. So how does the air assault school here at the Warrior Training Center, uh, Warrior Training Center differ from the air assault school run by the active component? So uh, overall, there's no difference um, as the executive agent for the air assault school overall. Um, we provide standards that they have to meet within. Um, obviously, they can add to it a little bit, but they just can't take away from, just like all the other Army doctrine, whatever. Uh, so overall, it's generally the same. Uh, biggest difference you might see, I know up at the 101st, sometimes they use um, CH-47 aircraft for repelling out of, whereas here we mainly use the UH-60. Uh, but as far as test standards, they're all the same. And is the length of the course the same, or is there any... It's the same. The only difference between Act Duty and National Guard School Houses is we work on the weekends. Act Duty doesn't. Okay. So, so you just go straight through. <laughs> we go straight through. And it's how, so is it 10 days straight through? or how, Okay. So one event after the other. Uh, where the active component, most of the troop schools, 101st, 25th, 10th Mountain, uh, they do weekends off. They also take in a smaller number of uh, students at a time. So we're they're used to doing no more than 130 at a time. We'll do... 250 oh wow so okay. and, and you mentioned that or you mentioned that that the national guard is the executive agent yeah. for aerosol school i didn't re i didn't realize that yeah. so what does that mean here for you guys at the wtc uh so what that means is we're the ones that write and update the pois the lesson plans mm -hmm. uh we publish all the standards on what needs to happen during the course as far as the testing bank what they're able to test on uh how they can teach certain loads, first thing loads, what knots they have to teach in phase three, and how to rig towers, and if something changes in the FM, we're the one that pushes it out to the other schoolhouses. Oh, wow. This is quite a bit, then. Um, there's a lot of institutional knowledge here. Then. <laughs> yeah, so. A lot more paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> so then, you, you, you mentioned the attention to detail. Um, obviously, it seems like there's a lot of little different tasks, you know. Um, how, you know, Regarding the physical aspect aspect of it, you mentioned you're going to be doing physical activities that uh, <laughs> that will tire you out. You know what? It, you know what does a day look like for air assault students? You know, typically. So, uh, depending on the phase that the air assault student is in, um, phase one, uh, a majority of your physical events are in phase one. So they'll have PT sessions every morning throughout phase one, uh, MSC one, which is general like an overview of strength and conditioning um, then you'll have a six mile road march and the day of the test you'll have rifle pt um, which i think is everybody's favorite uh, it's simply just pt with a instead of maybe a dumbbell or a barbell you're using a rifle nice. so um, and then they will also have a four mile run uh, going into the second day of phase two and a 12 mile road march at the end of the course that brings everything to a close. So, so I, I, I remember, I'm trying to think, it's been a long time, but I remember being terrified at the end of the 12 mile road march with the layout here. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? So, oh, do you want to take it? All right. So it goes into that whole aspect of attention to detail. Uh, okay. The bag layout, um, if you're, items aren't in exactly where they're supposed to be or you're not moving fast enough or you're not paying attention we don't tell you execute uh, there could be there's always repercussions repercussions for your actions so um, one way how we fix the group as a whole is we give them a little extra pt 
within standard. Um, so is it is that still a droppable event though? If they if you don't have like something on the packing list that you're supposed to have for the ruck march uh, at the end of aerosol school, or it is yeah. okay. Yeah, the the horror stories about missing ear pro or I didn't have a small chain on my dog tags is true. Okay. Um, so attention to detail. Attention the whole way to through. detail all the way through. Which I guess makes sense because like you were saying earlier, you know, you're rigging sling loads that could impact either aircraft, people, and, and any number of things. Is there a, t well, you know, what's, you know, obviously it's probably been a while since you guys went through the course, um, but you see it. What, you know, what is a really memorable experience you had going through air assault school um, and then now as an instructor? So I think just on for phase two on the back or on the inside as an instructor or NCIC of the course, that just being all, seeing all the work that goes into uh, the different loads and because depending on where we're teaching at, because we do do MTTs also at other locations, not just here at Fort Benning, uh, depending on where we're at, is depending on what equipment they have okay. available. And so being able to get into the TMs and the FMs to figure out the proper way to rig these loads that we don't have here at Fort Benning in order to teach the students um, how to properly do it and what FMs are the correct ones to go to it takes a lot of knowledge and attention to detail as our bounty has been mentioning uh, just because if we're going to Oklahoma then we do artillery pieces whereas here we don't have artillery and we do nothing with artillery uh, so just being able to know which TM to go into and figure out the proper way to rig these and find an inspection sequence that everybody can do and to help them pass the hands-on test then it that that's memorable for, for what i like about being on the inside and being able to see everything that goes into it and then obviously phase three repelling actually being able to throw students off the tower and aircraft yeah. uh it's much more than fun than just standing in line waiting so <laughs> nice hey and is there a time that we're sort of where you've used uh the some of the aerosol schools a application in like either a deployed environment or just um other operational environment yes so um i think as most people see overseas a lot of certain jobs are contracted so the phase two aspect is important but a lot of that is separate overseas uh the thing that i noticed after being aerosol qualified and being an instructor because i'm guard i also belong to another unit mm -hmm. Um, when I went back to my unit, being able to teach them about combat assault type operations or how to utilize aircraft for overseas was beneficial, not only for myself, but for my Joes that I was, yeah, uh, leading. And I guess it really gives you that foundation, right? I can, I, I can remember I came to a warfighter exercise and, uh, after air assault school, but it had been a few years, and they were like, oh, you're air assault qualified. Can you plan this uh, air assault operation? And I was like, no, but uh, I know what manual to look in for it. So uh, um, I was curious, yeah, if you'd had some examples. And, and, and do you guys also provide, like, some extra support to units or organizations out there that are looking for information directly related to air assault operations? Um, or can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, yes, sir. So, um... So we always have a lot of units come over here to our compound um, to practice on our O course, or we do a sling load instruction to random units um, just where they want to practice. Yeah. Or we can't certify them because they're not actually in the course and um, haven't been to slick uh, the sling load certification course. Uh, but just to get some familiarization of what they're seeing when they're out doing mm -hmm. other stuff and um, about three weeks ago, we actually had our Raven, the air crew here on Fort Benning, come over to get recertified on doing clean loads. Yeah, because I guess you had to maintain currency, right? Yeah. To do it. Yeah. Uh, and so they came over to for a private sling load course because the, they just pick up the stuff, mm -hmm. and so they wanted a class on what's actually how it's rigged. So when they get there and see what they're doing, they actually know what to look for to double check to make sure what they're picking up is actually going to work like it's supposed to and not damage their aircraft or 
get some light yeah. hurt. So uh, we did that a few weeks ago. And then um, next month in January, we got Kendrick High School uh, coming over. Oh, wow. Uh, to, same thing, do O course, um, you know, do some repelling, teach them how to repel. So it's like a little bit of the, almost like the guard aspect of like, hey, we do stuff with the local communities yeah, as well. Right. Yeah. Sergeant Pounder, you've been an instructor here for quite some time now, right? <laughs> yeah, I've been on there. <laughs> so, you know, where, where, is there traditional places that you do MTTs at, or is it, you know, unit requested or specific, or what does that look like for when you guys travel from Fort Benning to do these classes elsewhere? So our training schedule does go in kind of a yearly cycle. So okay. maybe a two year cycle or a three year cycle. Um, if you are here for three years, odds are you will go back to the same place um, to teach. Uh, a lot of guard states like Oregon, Pennsylvania, Oklahoma, um, they request every year that we come to them, whether it be the same unit or the state as a whole. Um, we have done training overseas. Uh, we had just recently gotten back from Germany. Um, the 173rd had paid for a course. We are going back to Germany this January for another 173rd oh, nice. course. Um, we have gone to CENTCOM, Kuwait, to teach aerosol school. We've also gone to Camp Casey, South Korea, and so you've been all over. Yeah, Rogers. Hey, you know what's what's one of those most memorable experiences you've had as an instructor working with aerosol in your time here, or what's your favorite part of the course? How about that? My favorite part of the course. Uh, I started out as a phase one instructor, okay. so my favorite part of the course is phase one. It is the most physical, and I feel that's where I'm utilized the most to actually teach people and see the light bulb go off. Because um, with phase two, you have a physical item. You can explain it and show it to them. With phase one, especially when you start to get more in the realms of Pathfinder operations, mm -hmm. LZPZ operations, stuff like that. Uh, it's very confusing at first because it's a little bit of a higher uh, knowledge base and to watch individuals go like oh what like that uh i think that's probably the best part about aerosol school now have you done things so you like our sergeant hall or you mentioned the high school coming out doing stuff have you done other things um either locally here in the community or when you were back with your units um related to some of the aerosol operations that you've done here so I personally haven't, no. Um, I'm not sure if Sergeant Pound can speak to something in the past. Um, I have not, but I think everybody remembers Katrina. Uh, I wasn't part of that, but the National Guard as a whole did a plethora of air assault style operations, movement of fuel and supplies, um, just even here at home. And as recent as in Texas when they had all their major flooding. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So the, the National Guard almost benefits more from uh, air assault school, in my opinion, for re disaster relief and... Yeah, all of our domestic operations missions, mm -hmm. kind of, it seems like. You know, we, I know we were talking before a little bit about this, but what are some specific things that you would recommend units do to help prepare soldiers to come here and be successful? Build an OML, okay? okay. Maybe not the most physically fit kid in the unit or person in the unit. Um, yes, you do need to be physically fit to come, but also test his aptitude for learning. Like, can he learn on the fly? Is he competent? Does he have good attention to detail from the start? Um, and also when you're building that OML, take a couple weekends, uh, cause as national guard soldiers, we are referenced as weekend warriors, use your drills to, test your soldiers. If you have to, take them to a local RTI, take them to a track, plan a route for a six mile road march. Because yes, he may be a PT stud or the individual may be the greatest in the platoon, but can he accomplish the goal after he has spent three days in a row doing physical exercise, mental exhaustion, and complete the road march without injury. Can he 
you know. So make sure they're well rounded. Yes. Make and sure, make sure, sure well they can rounded. climb a rope. Those are the two things. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, so pretty much solid. Don't just well, throw spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. All right. Like take your time, pick your people. Well, as instructors, what's your message or like advice, we'll say, to soldiers who are getting ready to come here as students um, directly as far as like, hey, they're, they're, they know they got a slot, they're on their way. What's your piece of advice to them? My piece, uh, you got a slot, come hydrated. Uh, and just be ready physically. <laughs> Be ready to train. Yeah. Ready, what about ready, you, Sir Hall? Uh, I would say look at the packing lists and make sure you're bringing the appropriate equipment, uh, especially if we're doing courses at northern places where it gets colder, uh, especially during the winter. Even here in Georgia, uh, we're on our PT yesterday morning was 29 degrees. Oh yeah. So uh, just because you're in a southern state or southern region, make sure you're checking the weather, bringing the appropriate equipment to, for the weather and the proper equipment for the packing list. Because as we mentioned before, uh, that at the end of the rug marches, you have a bag layout. And if you're missing the smallest little thing, that's a drop criteria. Mm -hmm. So you might do nine of the tennis target days in your army and get dropped on the last one because you're missing a chain on your dog tags. Yeah, not ideal. <laughs> So just double check your stuff um, and make sure you have the proper equipment. Just, I think it'll be my biggest piece. Well, thank you, Sergeant Holler and Sergeant Pounding for joining us and sharing some of your experiences and uh, tips for success for future aerosol students. Not a problem, sir. If you liked today's episode and would like more information on aerosol school or any of the topics we discussed today, please visit our social media pages in the links below or visit us online at www.nationalguard.mil slash leader development. If you liked today's episode, please don't forget to subscribe below and leave us a five-star review. You can find us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts.